The legacy media is regurgitating liberal talking points again and again and again. It's Fake News Friday. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. It's the last week of the campaign and the last Friday of the campaign. So we will do Fake News Friday as we usually do. We go through the most egregious examples of the legacy media here in Canada, completely misleading people, presenting their opinion or liberal talking points, partisan spin, as if that is fact. And we see this over and over and over again in the media. In fact, all of the examples on the show today are exactly that. And I talked about this phenomenon on my show earlier this week. I covered in depth the CBC town hall events. They did one with Aaron O'Toole. The next night was with Justin Trudeau. They also did them with the other party leaders, but I didn't follow those as closely. But what we saw from the CBC and what we saw from host Rosemary Barton was the way that she presented the ideas, the way that she framed the debate and the line of questioning that she was asking Aaron O'Toole when he was in the hot seat was exactly based on liberal spin. It wasn't based on the facts. It wasn't based on the truth. It was based on how the liberals have framed this issue to create a wedge issue to try to trap conservatives. And we saw that over and over and over again. Why else would Rosemary Barton be talking about issues that are are just not important at all in this election. She was grilling Erin O'Toole on guns, even though gun violence isn't really an issue in Canada, specifically not the gun, the guns that were banned by Trudeau. There is a problem with gun violence in this country. We don't address it because the problem stems from gangs. Most of the guns used are illegal and they're smuggled in from the United States. This liberal gun ban doesn't really address that at all. But again, because it's a liberal wedge issue designed to make Aaron O'Toole look like he's, what, a gun-toting hick, uh, the CBC jumps right in line and hammers Aaron O'Toole over that using liberal spin. Same thing with conversion therapy, the bill that was really, really taken out of context. And again, you just saw this dominating debate. Instead of talking about the economic recovery, instead of talking about jobs in the economy, instead of talking about debt and government spending, the CBC instead focused on a, few, a handful of really niche issues that the liberals have used as a weapon. And then when it was Justin Trudeau's turn in the hot seat, well, he wasn't asked any kind of tough question whatsoever. It was the same sort of idea, more liberal, pro-liberal spin in the talking points, really designed to prop him up. And it's no wonder because, once again, Justin Trudeau is pledging billions of dollars, over a billion dollars every single year to the CBC. And so it's no wonder they have such a chummy relationship. But it isn't just the CBC, and I'm going to point this out today. So the first story I'm going to talk about is over on CTV. This story made a lot of hay on social media this week. The headline says, liberals would make it a criminal offense to block healthcare buildings and threaten workers. So this is obviously in response to a lot of those protests that we saw uh, over the course of the entire campaign, lots of people rallying in the big cities. We saw a huge rally the other weekend in Montreal, another one in Toronto. And there have also been rallies that follow the liberal campaign and Justin Trudeau, basically just to boo and heckle him. And we've seen these smaller protests outside of uh, hospitals, people really just uh, protesting for a variety of reasons. They might be protesting against the vaccine, they might be protesting against vaccine passports, they might be protesting against lockdowns. P people who are basically just fed up with the uh, lockdowns and the pandemic and all the things we've been having to deal with, the expansive growth of government over the last 18 months or so. So so people are protesting for their own reasons. Uh, we've seen these protesters basically get scapegoated throughout the entire campaign, uh, really being demonized, especially by liberal leader Justin Trudeau, but also in the media. So this is sort of the, the, the media's favorite topic right now. It gives them the ability to condemn what they perceive as being far-right protesters and to sort of celebrate the liberals for what? Uh, condemning them and coming down on them. And the only problem with the Liberals annou announcement here is that this is literally already the case. This is literally already the case. This isn't a new law that the Liberals are proposing. This is a law that is already on the books. You cannot block critical infrastructure. You cannot block healthcare workers from getting into their place of work. And so we saw some people point that out. Here's Andrew McDougall, a columnist over at the Ottawa Citizen. He writes, when you announce something that already exists and dupe the dot-com team into giving you a straight up headline, that is embarrassing. And then we have a conservative candidate and MP Garnet Jenis who tweets this. He says, this is from page 33 of the conservative platform. Trudeau a bit late on the issue of blocking critical infrastructure. I know it feels like a long time ago now, but back in 2020, before the pandemic really hit and before it became what it was, we saw a group of fringe far-left protesters basically hijack the issue of First Nations, pretend that they speak for First Nations and that they oppose any kind of natural resource development or pipelines going across their lands. 
and basically just absolutely recklessly endangering people's lives by blocking freeways, blocking railways. They entirely shut down the nation's railway system for weeks, for weeks. They prevented people from their livelihood. They stopped people from being able to do their jobs. We saw some crazy footage of people throwing things onto railway tracks when there were trains coming, incredibly dangerous stuff. And when that all happened, when that all happened, Trudeau was basically silent. He didn't do anything to stop the blockades. He didn't arrest anyone. He didn't come out strongly and say enough is enough. He, he basically just sat back and let it happen and watched it all happen. And so it is a little bit rich now, all of a sudden, when the protesters are protesting something that he doesn't like, he is coming down hard and introducing a law that already exists, shame on CTV for even publishing this nonsense. Again, this is liberal spin that is being presented as if it is real news. It is not news. It is not news to, with a couple days left in the campaign, introduce a new law that is already a law. That's that's not a thing. And the fact that they didn't even point out how hypocritical it is for Trudeau to be doing this when he sat silent when those other protests were happening is a joke. It's why even though CTV is private, even though they don't get as much money as CDBC or other media outlets, they are still in the can and completely untrustworthy. All right, moving on, I want to talk about this next story in the Toronto Star. And now I know I could literally go through the Toronto Star every single morning, flip through the entire paper and explain how each and every story is fake news. But this one is particularly bad. It basically repeats every false left-wing claim about immigration and presents it as fact. And that is the problem. So here's a headline. It says, Aaron O'Toole recycles a sheer era false claim. No, thousands of asylum seekers haven't crossed illegally at Roxham Road. Well, actually, it is a fact that yes, they have crossed illegally at Roxham Road. I know this because in 2008, I reported from the ground at Roxham Road. I went and traveled there. It's about an hour and a half south of Montreal, right at the New York-Quebec border. There is a big sign right at the border crossing that says it is illegal. It says stop. It is illegal to cross at this border. Stop. It is illegal to cross at this border. That's because according to Canadian law, you cannot enter into Canada other than at a port of entry. So you can only cross into the country at a port of entry. The entire purpose of Roxham Road is because it was an easy place for people to get from the United States to get into Canada illegally. So crossing that border in between points of entry is illegal. It is illegal to cross the border, and it is correct to say that the people who do this were illegal border crossers. This was a huge issue when Trump was the president of the United States. The media loved to emphasize and, and to really highlight the fact that all these people were leaving the United States and trying to get into Canada. They were taking advantage of Canada's generosity, okay? Canada is signatory to a number of immigration laws and treaties, international treaties, many of them do protect the rights of asylum seekers. So a person does have the right to come into Canada, basically throw their hands up in the air, say, I'm a refugee. And then at that point, they become protected under Canadian law. They get uh, access to a bunch of um, entitlements and rights, just like a Canadian citizen. And one of them is a fair trial um, in front of a judge where they get to present their case. And the judge determines whether or not their uh, asylum case is legitimate and whether they can stay and become a refugee or whether it's bogus and they get rejected and they get deported back to their home. So so, so that, 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 that part is protected. Once they come to Canada, and do that, then they're no longer illegal. You usually, usually when we're talking about immigration, a person is an illegal immigrant if they're not registered to the system. So if they're just in Canada, they haven't registered anywhere, they just kind of come in the country and go dark. Or alternatively, if they are uh, if they overstay their visa. So if they get rejected by a refugee judge or if they're just here as a visitor and decide not to leave, if there's a pending deportation order out against them, then that person would also be considered an illegal immigrant. So I agree in theory that if you are an asylum seeker who comes in, you're not an illegal immigrant, but you have crossed the border illegally. And so that's what we're talking about here. And it is just flat out wrong to say that people have the right to do that and that it's not unlawful. It is illegal. Like I said, there's a big sign that says stop is illegal to cross here. And also the reason that they're doing it. So Canada is uh, part of a treaty with the United States called the Safe Third Country Agreement. There's a lot of countries around the world that accept refugees. And basically the assumption uh, for everyone is, look, you can come, you can come to Canada. Canada and try to get refuge here. But the idea is if you're fl if you're truly fleeing persecution, if you're fleeing danger, you will present your refugee case at the very first safe country that you get in. So say you're um, fleeing, I don't know, so some Arab country in the Middle East, and you get on a boat and you take that boat and you land on an island in Greece, right? So, so you can't just say, okay, well, Greece, 
uh, doesn't really offer a lot of welfare benefits. So I'm not going to make my asylum claim here. I'm going to get back on a boat and try to make it to France because I know that France has a better package. You, you can't do that. And so Canada and the U.S. have this agreement called the Safe Third Country Agreement saying if you land in the United States, you have to make your application there for refugee status. If you land in Canada, you have to make your application there. There are a few exceptions, say if you have family members in one of the other countries or you might have a reason that you would be better suited to go there. Um, but by and large, it is illegal. So all this is just to say, it's illegal. Of course it's illegal. It's illegal to cross a border. It's illegal to uh, shop around and choose which country you make your asylum claim in. But what this story is really saying is the opposite of that, that everything is just fine and dandy and that this is just an example of mean old Aaron O'Toole who is unnecessarily scapegoating refugees just like mean old Andrew Scheer did in 2019. And that's basically just what they say. They find an activist uh, lawyer to say it is not illegal to cross the Canada-US border for the purpose of seeking refugees protection. It, it is illegal if you cross in between crossings. If you if you showed up at a border crossing and tried to present refugee status, then that wouldn't be illegal, but they would turn you away. They would say, no, you can't do this. So the reason that people are going in between the border crossings is literally because a loophole has presented itself, and that is what Aaron O'Toole wants to get rid of. Now, interestingly, when the Conservatives and Aaron O'Toole released their platform, um, this was included. And I think True North might have been the only outlet that covered it, that, that, they, that the Conservatives specifically talked about um, correct down on this loophole, closing the loophole, stopping the illegal immigration, and protecting the integrity of our immigration system. Not many people uh, picked up on it. True North did cover it. I think it was a good policy, and I'm happy to see it in there. And I was a little surprised that the media didn't catch up on it. And here it is, what, two weeks later, uh, the Toronto Star has done this ridiculous hit piece, um, <laughs> literally saying the opposite of what's true. They found another immigration activist to say, it's perfectly lawful. Well, it isn't. And this is also something I found interesting. So you can see that they posted this sign, a picture of this sign that says notice um, claiming refugee status in Canada. And then it just basically lets people know that, look, this isn't a free ride. You still have to go through legal process and it's possible you'll get rejected. And that, you, you know, it literally says here, um, claiming asylum is not a free ticket into Canada. Not everyone is eligible for asylum. So anyway, I've been to this location. There's a, that sign right there and literally right next to that sign, this is how dishonest the star is. They show this sign, literally right next to that sign is a sign saying, stop, it is illegal to cross here. But they don't show the full picture of the two signs. They just show the one sign kind of detailing uh, what, what what it's like to claim refugee status. Again, unbelievable, completely fake news. And I really don't expect anything better than the Toronto Star, but had to point that out. All right, moving on. Next, we have a story in the CBC. The headline reads, between violence and vandalisms, the parties are experiencing a very ugly campaign. And they found a group called the Canadian Anti-Hate Network to say that this is the worst campaign in recent memory for far-right activism. So basically, the gist of the story is that we're seeing a lot of vandalism, a lot of uh, protesters, a lot of profanity on the campaign trail this time around. And of course, they blame it all on, you guessed it, the far-right. So this group, the, anti, the Canadian Anti-Hate Network, network. They're a government-funded organization. Basically, the entire purpose of this network is to demonize the right, to, to make the right seem like they're this really dangerous, shadowy organization. Every single time that they're quoted in a news piece is exactly the same. They're fear-mongering and trying to scare us. They're trying to just broadly demonize the right, very broadly, not very specific. So look, of course, there are crazy people on the right, just like there's crazy people on the left. But what this organization really focuses on is making it seem like the right in Canada. And that means the conservatives sort of by proxy but that that's the biggest threat to our country. And so they, they, they sort of parade them out, the CBC and other legacy media networks kind of parade them out to repeat this this shtick time and time again. So we're supposed to believe this is the worst campaign in recent memory. Maybe it is. Look, I've been watching partisan politics for a long time. We always see this kind of stuff. It's kind of ugly. But again, some people just really hate politicians. They really hate the electoral system. They might hate a specific party or their specific candidate. And this is how it manifests, of course, vandalism is wrong and it's illegal and we should crack down on it. I like uh, how all of a sudden vandalism is a big problem when it's targeting a liberal and yet all summer when we saw vandalism of uh, churches across the country uh, and statues, you know, we didn't see any kind of outreach. We didn't see the Canadian anti-hate network uh, coming out and condemning it. Of course not. It's because it's a partisan group who is really just designed um, to create fear and hatred of the right and it is really disgusting and gross to see. All right, and final story I want to talk about here on Fake News Friday is a op-ed that was published in the CBC. This headline says, 
As an Anishinaabe citizen, I can't vote in good conscience in the federal election. Casting a ballot in the federal election erodes the sovereignty of First Nations. So the entire idea here is what, that Canada is this horrible colonialist state and that even the very act of us having a government and having an election undermines the rights and uh, freedoms of First Nations people. This is just really chock full of all the leftist woke nonsense that we've been hearing. Canada is a colonialized system full of suppression and oppression of First Nations and really just over the top hatred of Canada saying that everything about our society is irredeemably broken and therefore voting is just cementing that in. Instead, First Nations people should not vote, which is just really disheartening. If you're, if you're a young person on a reserve or in a First Nations community, the message you should hear is encouraging you to get involved, make positive change, get out there, you know, speak for your community, or speak for yourself, and participate. And instead, this is the exact opposite message. It's so sort of cemented in defeatism, all the all the buzzwords that you would expect and the the, the outcome is just is just sort of sad because what um, you want a Marxist revolution and you refuse to participate until then that the only way to fix Canada is to completely tear it apart to the ground and build something new up well I've got news for you if you do that if you go ahead and do that the thing that will be built in Canada's place will not be as good as Canada it will not be as fair and safe and secure and free as Canada because it is an ideological experiment in utopia and those never work out. That never works out. So th this, this message is just really disheartening for the CBC to publish, especially on the eve of the federal election campaign. Shame on the CBC for encouraging people not to vote and not to participate, especially people who are part of communities that really we would want more representation and more involvement. So again, just a, a really sad, uh, pitiful message for the CBC, typically amplifying, but really do expect any better. I do not. All right, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great weekend and we will be back for election coverage on Monday. Thank you so much. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show.